Hey, I'm Catherine Gilliard, a Francis Ellen Watkins Harper Editorial Fellow at the 19th. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, today's conversation is a part of the Tulsa Project, an ongoing series of stories exploring the ripples, both past and the ones still living with us, resulting from the Tulsa Massacre in 1921, namely those of politics and power. In 1921, the community of Greenwood, also known as Black Wall Street, was devastated when a white mob burned, bombed, and brutally massacred its residents. While the massacre is undeniably a defining moment in Tulsa's history, the story doesn't end there. Mary E. Jones Parrish, a survivor of the massacre, fled with her daughter, Florence, in hand to escape the horrors that were prevailing through the night. She returned, dedicating her work to recording the experiences and stories of other survivors in the community. Around 1922, Parrish published her seminal work, The Nation Must Awake, also known as The Events of the Tulsa Disaster, what will become one of the most referenced and foundational accounts of the massacre to date. Despite the gravity and impact of this work, when the conversation lands around survivors and impactful Tulsans, many women, Mary among them, are, as Built from the, Built from the Fire author Victor Lucasen says, relegated to the footnotes of history. In 1972, Mary E. Jones Parrish passed, but her legacy continues. Annalise M. Bruner, Parrish's great-granddaughter, has used her work as a writer and lecturer to amplify the women of Tulsa, namely her great-grandmother, and their work to give them their flowers and credits where it's due. Join us for a conversation with Bruner as we explore her journey to uplift Mary's name and her work so that we never forget them. Hello, Annalise, and thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm fine, Catherine. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your asking. Okay, so I want to start with something you told me, uh, corrected me, actually, um, and I'm glad you did when we first spoke uh, in talking about the Tulsa massacre. Um, and you said, it's like, we call it the massacre and why. Um, so I want to ask you, why aren't these terms interchangeable with regard to what happened in Tulsa in 1921? Well, we do call it a massacre, and there has been an evolution uh, from the term riot to massacre, and there are several reasons. I think Dr. Scott Ellsworth uh, mentions this in many of the lectures that he does. Uh, one of the primary points is that the insurance companies at the time were prone to calling these things riots because within the insurance policies, the term riot is very specifically used to kind of help them evade respons financial responsibility. So once uh, disturbance is deemed a riot, then the insurance companies are off the hook uh, for paying out on the policies. We saw that very much to be the case in Tulsa, and certainly one can extrapolate and believe perhaps that in the other uh, cases where there have been these what, what we call pogroms uh, in Black communities across the country, for example, the Red Summer uh, Perhaps those were the same kinds of um, machinations that uh, insurance companies used. Uh, newspapers of the time, which were pre predominantly of the um, dominant community, uh, also called it a riot in order to, um, to escape or to avoid having to um, lay the blame at the foot of um, those who were in power and to kind of make it an equal situation when it actually was not. And so a massacre is, that word is actually much more descriptive, much more correct, much more historically accurate. I want to pull the thread on that a little bit um, and speak to, uh, we're here today to talk about uh, your great-grandmother, Mary Parrish, um, and uh, particularly to uh, the work that she did in writing um, uh, the, the Nation Must Awake. Can you speak to what happened in Tulsa that, underscores the reason for this being a massacre and, and where uh, Mary's work comes into the picture. Her comes into the picture, I think, um, in terms of her having been asked to do this after the fact, but also certainly there had to be had to be an internal drive. I know that in my own writings about this topic, I was inspired, I was spurred, I felt compelled to say what I thought um, and to um, draw the parallels as I have between uh, what happened uh, in Tulsa in 1921 and a more recent um, uprising, if you will, um, an attack on democracy itself that happened on January 6th. Um, so in, in my hometown now, uh, Washington, DC. And so when we think about the events and, and that was the original title of her book, The Events of the Tulsa Disaster. Certainly it was a disaster, 
Uh, but events uh, is a very nebulous term and it's open to interpretation. But in terms of a through line, the story is uh, familiar thematically. Um, there is a precipitating event, which we know uh, was Dick Rowland going into the elevator with Sarah Page in the Drexel building. Some kind of kerfuffle happened. She screamed. He, aware of what that would have looked at, like to other people, particularly um, in that business, the white downtown business environment of Tulsa, he fled. And um, fearing for his life, of course. Um, and eventually it came to pass that he had good reason to fear. Um, that was really the, the um, kind of, as I said, precipitating event, but there were things going on in the background that were setting the stage for this conflagration that happened because one can certainly um, and reasonably assume that within the number of hours from that event, his arrest, the attempted abduction, his attempted at abduction from the jail and the massacre over the two days of May 31st to June 1st, the planning would have had to already be in place. It just was so um, effectively and, and, and cruelly executed um, that it doesn't seem haphazard. And so certainly the people would have wanted, in, living in that time, would have wanted to respond to that. Can you tell me uh, more about the moment that you first learned about Tulsa um, and your connection to Mary Parish? Well, that's a complicated question, um, and I'll, I'll try to parse it out in an understandable way. Um, as I mentioned a few moments ago, I do live in Washington, D.C. It's been my home for almost four years, uh, but I maintain close connections with my relatives in San Francisco, where I grew up. And um, there is a reason why I was in San Francisco, why I found myself there as a child. Um, it was because my father followed his mother, who was Florence, little Florence, in, in Mary's account, followed his mother to California. She had come in the 1940s, I believe, searching for a couple of different things, um, one of them being her husband, who had gone off to war in the Pacific Theater, and didn't return home. And from what I can gather, uh, people didn't weren't really aware of what had happened to him. And so she went behind trying to find out. Um, she settled there. My father remained in Tulsa and he came later after he had, for college, after he had graduated from high school to reunite with his mother. Um, when I found out about the book, I was in my mid thirties, my father, gave me a copy. I'll show it to you now. It's a little red book called Events of the Tulsa Disaster by Mrs. Mary E. Jones Parrish. And this is the actual copy that he gave me. It is inscribed by one of the Jones family members, to William Bruner Jr. I don't know if you can see it at all, but it's to William Bruner Jr., my father, from Carol A. Jones someone who was obviously a, re a, a relative of Mary Jones Parish. Uh, when he gave it to me, he did charge me with doing something with it. He had never mentioned it before. He'd never talked very much about his childhood, his teenage years in Tulsa. He had never, from what I can gather from my mother, and, and they divorced when we were quite young, he had never spoken about any of this to her either. Her mother-in-law, Florence, never spoke to her about this. And um, so it was, I, for lack of a better term, a family secret, but I can't say that it's because anyone was ashamed or it was because um, this reason or that reason. I can only speculate. I can only say to myself as a way of helping myself reconcile um, this thing that was hanging in the air over our family all this time, uh, and no one uh, having mentioned it to me, I can only say that perhaps they were trying to protect us um, as children, as young people, from the knowledge of such a heinous crime uh, for which um, justice had never been served. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of families want their children to grow up 
without the burdens of some of the horrible events of the past. And perhaps for their own sanity, they put it aside because they feel that there isn't anything that they can do about it. Um, and so my father didn't give it to me until I was, I think he thought I was ready. I think that's what, I think that was, you know, he was deliberate with his timing. And of his four children, he chose me to be the one um, to carry this um, story of Mary Paris, Parrish and her work forward. I know we've talked before, and I think when um, we were speaking before, I was, I kept thinking back to the exact night you mentioned um, Little Florence at the time, uh, from the moment like Dick Rowland, his escape, like uh, Dick Rowland and the attempted uh, kidnapping of him and the moments that led up to um, the massacre starting to when Little Florence comes up to her mom and she's like, you know, there are men at the window, I see men with guns. Can you speak about that moment? I really want to um, set that scene for people. Absolutely. Um, it is a pivotal moment in the book. It is a pivotal moment for my family. It is a pivotal moment for me personally. Um, the events had, were unfolding, and I use the term very much, I guess, the way she would have. Events were unfolding right on Greenwood Avenue, and her apartment was right on Greenwood Avenue in the Woods Building. She had her small business there. She also had her apartment there where she and her daughter lived. She had had a, a long day. Uh, she had, you know, she was an entrepreneur. She had taken um, not only students, private students in to her own school in the evenings, but during the day, she worked at the Y, she taught at the YMCA. So she was definitely an industrious person, a, a resolute person, an independent person. And she says, even in the book, she had never really wanted for anything uh, within reason. And she was always able to provide for her child. And so she was relaxing after a very long day at work, a day at the office, a day at her second job. I mean, you know, these things kind of sound familiar to us, don't they? And so she's there, you know, trying to unwind uh, for her evening uh, and do a little reading, something recreational, something just for herself. And she, it being a warm evening, she had opened the window and um, let the evening breeze in. It was, it was still spring. And so it wasn't unbearably hot yet uh, at night. And so little Florence was amusing herself by looking out the window and watching the world go by. And as she saw the world go by, it was turning into a very dark world. There were men out there with guns um, and we don't, know exactly who uh, the folks were. Were they the people who were defending the district? Were they the, were they the invaders? We don't have you know that level of uh, detail, but we do know that she cried out to her mother. I see men with guns, agitated, obviously. Um, and Mary initially didn't take heed of, of you know her previous kind of agitation at the window. But when she said men with guns, that's when Mary flung her book aside, jumped to the window and saw that her child, only seven, was saying something that was factual, that was real, that was happening in real time. It wasn't, you know, playtime. Playtime is over. And uh, she remained uh, in the house for a while. Fires had started to burn. Uh, the invaders were encroaching on the district. Her neighbors had fled. But she was thinking, uh, perhaps uh, it'll be better just to stay in my in my home. Uh, things may blow over, but they didn't. And as as the conditions outside grew worse, um, she decided that she had better pray and and make her escape with her child, uh, running north on Greenwood Avenue uh, towards safety. Uh, when she hit the street, um, and this is very difficult for me to contemplate when she describes getting out onto the street and a voice ringing out get out of the street with that kid with that kid or you'll both be killed because that's how dire the circumstances were planes flying dropping bombs and bull and uh, uh dynamite uh and uh, people shooting fires um uh, folks driving by running over pedestrians um, you know, uh, shooting, basically what we would today call a drive-by shooting, shooting people as they fled. And so um, they were in a perilous, uh, perilous position. And uh, through grace, she was spared and she was able to live and write about it.
there are so many um accounts and uh both from the, the nation must awaken and um Mary's accounts and others that I've seen that speak to some of the horrors of that night and I can't even imagine even with the words in front of me imagine what being in that situation like it feels like um looks like living through it and then coming back to doing that work people spoke about like seeing cars dragging the, the bodies of black men down the street even when some of the fire brigades came to put out some of the fires the part of the white mob who descended on greenwood were shooting um and and like mowing down the members of the fire brigade so they couldn't even save you know the the people who were trying to save you know what little bit that they could um uh, of the district and these people's lives and livelihood um but to to see that and to to go through that and then to come back and do the work that she did um it's it it it's it, it's a, a a big thing to wrap, to wrap my mind around but mary did it um so like I and now I want to talk more about her work but I want to take a like a pause and whenever you speak about and we've spoken before and I, you know, read your writing, there's a, a way uh, and an intention and this kind of um, uh, honoring uh, in, in, in your voice when you speak about Mary and her work. So I want to ask you in your words, uh, tell me who your grandmother um, was, uh, your, your, sorry, your great grandmother was and what, what does her work mean to you? Well, I am in awe of what she did. I am in awe of the fact that she remained so resolute um, in the face of having just experienced this horrible trauma, um, she actually took, she says she took comfort in coming back and helping to the, record the stories of others who had similarly lived through uh, this awful event. Um, she calls it a Holocaust um, and she likens it to the pogroms in Poland and Russia at that time. And this was, you know, um, on the heels of World War I, and we know that there were so many anti-democratic and authoritarian forces afoot in Europe that were affecting the whole world. Mary was a person who was aware of all of that. Uh, these, uh, and, and I think she was an exemplar of what we saw in Greenwood, people who were engaged in the world around them, who were engaged in um, you know, uh, civic and political life, who were engaged in um, uh, financial acquisition, learning to be independent and stand on their own uh, because, you know, they had uh, certainly them or mem or, or their immediate uh, forebears, memories of enslavement. And so these were people who were on the move. These were people who aspired to things for themselves and their community. And Mary wanted to be a part of that. She had been living in Rochester, but she had family members in the Tulsa area uh, whom she had come to visit. And when she saw Greenwood and what it represented, and she, she specifically says businessmen and businesswomen, businessmen and businesswomen doing um, what they were doing to uh, promote their community, to uh, move their race forward. She was, in, she was impressed and inspired, and that's why she moved there. And she said, not so much for financial gain, but for the spirit of the place, the intention of the place, the potential and possibility of the place. That's why she came there. And, and she didn't abandon Greenwood. She came back and she told the story. And I, I, I forever am grateful to her. And I think that um, we should all be um, somewhat reverential of her memory because um, of the uh, importance of, of, of this work um, and its centrality to so much of the scholarship that has happened um, in the years since. It makes me uh, wanna kind of segue into your work and, and how much of that uh, work has going has has gone to that um that that effort or to that end um but there's like one more thing that I want to pull the thread on and I I and I want to pull the thread on this because I really um in, in doing all like the researching and reading about this learning and, and knowing about not only what Mary did and, and um this work you know that she produced and shared but you know, she did this really heavy work of, you know, not only surviving it, but coming back, but bearing witness and the risk to do so. Um, and I want to speak to like how risky <laughs> that was and how that adds to the gravity of um, what, what this work means. Um, can you speak to like, what was the temperature of the country at that time? Um, one thing uh, at, 
I'll say uh, as a preface to my uh, comments um, is that when people started to research this in much later decades, like in the 70s, 80s, 90s or whatever, reporters at that time who came and were asking questions about what happened in Tulsa, they received death threats. They received death threats. And um, a lot of the newspaper accounts of the time were never transferred over into microfilm and microfiche. And so one can conclude that there was a certain impetus to uh, squelch this story and to kind of keep it under the lid. So if we imagine that in, you know, the latter part of the 20th century, think about the earlier part of the 20th, 20th century, the risk of talking about this, exposing this, um, bringing attention to it certainly had to be great. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned business women uh, in that district. There were um, social organizations that were typically charitable and so forth. Um, even domestic workers, they had their own group of, of folks. Now, we do know that immediately in the aftermath, in the next few days, those people had to still go to work. They had to still show up in downtown, in the places and the homes of people they knew had come and participated in this um, in this horrible, horrible catastrophe. So the atmosphere um, that was prevailing in the wake of the uh, massacre had certainly had to be one of tension and fear. Um, one can easily imagine um, when we think about what happened in the latter part uh, of the, um, the 20th century, when reporters were trying to find out more information about this kind of hidden event. And I, I, and I won't just say hidden, that's a little bit passive. The news of this was deliberately squelched. Uh, this was not something that initially Tulsa was particularly um, happy to have, uh, to have known uh, a, 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 in a broader sense. They, they didn't want people to know about this. It was, you know, um, anathema to their promotion of the city as a place to do business. Uh, and for any number of reasons, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say uh, that very many people uh, were um, ashamed on a moral level, but certainly some were. Um, I, I, I don't know that, that those were the people who were in power. Um, and, and to your point about what the climate was like. So it would have been, you know, a, a risky proposition to, to go around reporting and talking about this. Uh, but at the same time, we also know that it was a time of, um, I will say, infiltration of, of the government uh, at the state level and at the local level by the uh, Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Victor Lukerson in his book names, uh, in, in Mary Parrish's book, I think certainly they knew or had their suspicions. I don't think they dared to put that down in print that these are the these are the city fathers. These are the you know the uh, newspaper owners who participated by word or deed in this awful in these awful deeds. And and so I'm certain it was a tenuous uh, time to be going around asking people questions. And if you'll notice in the book in her stories, some people wanted to remain anonymous in their comments. That tells us a lot. Um, thank you for that. I, I really wanted people to, um, like, I, like I said, understand the, the gravity uh, of that, um, which is why I think Mary's story is is so important. Um, before we talk a bit more about your work and where your work has come in and in, in, uh, singing Mary's song and giving her her flowers, um, when I was uh, reading the the afterward you wrote in the Na Nation Must Awake uh, that you published in, in 2021, um, in it you tell the story of your friend whose family um, had fled Tulsa during the massacre and found refuge 
refuge in Detroit. Um, and even gener generations later, we're still feeling the ripples of the displacement, especially financially. Um, can you speak to the discourse around um, economic empowerment and mobility and how it stands up without the inclusion of intersectional experiences? Like I think of people who are disabled and those who like your friends, family, and so many in Tulsa have been displaced due to events like this and had no like aid or compensation or appropriate resources um, to rebuild. Um, and for whom it's like the, the thought of um, a, a future is almost a privilege. It's like, how can I even think of that? And so people are having all these conversations and, you know, telling us, you know, we want to get here and this is what you need to do, but not taking into account um, this kind of starting behind uh, where, where people are. Can you speak to uh, that? So I have used the word disruption. And I think that it's important to recognize that um, it's a cliche. People say for every step forward, there are two steps back. And we don't really um, delve into the import of, of that notion. And I think in Tulsa, it is particularly easy to grasp. We see that um, people have been making progress. Um, people were standing up on their own two feet. All um, you know, tropes of um, uh, lack of industry in the Black community, lack of ambition, uh, lack of intellect, all the kinds of negative things that are um, the, the tool of an abusive system to excuse its own evil. And so um, we see that uh, although Tulsa did have its problems, we, I think, sometimes romanticize um, the um, level of development there prior to uh, the massacre. I mean, Mary talks about it in her book. There were some, you know, open air sewers, things of this nature, because in the north of the north of downtown Tulsa, where Greenwood was, where Black Wall Street was, Greenwood Avenue, there was a dearth of public utilities. Everything wasn't lit the way it was in downtown Tulsa. All the sewers weren't built the way they were in downtown Tulsa. Electricity, phone, these kinds of things um, were, um, I won't say being actively withheld, but they were just not available um, to the way uh, they were downtown. And so was that by design, the withholding of resources to make it easier to take over those districts um, when it was time, when people decided from a development standpoint that um, you know they were ready to move on that area and it would, it would, would be um, a little bit um, more convenient to upend folks who didn't have all the everyday I, I hate to call it amenities, the everyday conveniences that help you to have an organized and non-chaotic life. Um, Tulsa didn't have a, I mean, Greenwood didn't have a bank there. And so it's an infrastructure issue, certainly. And um, I think that um, people fail to sometimes understand that there is a supporting scaffold thing uh, to society that provides people with uh, the support and the uh, and the grace, the time and the space to pursue the things that actually move them forward that are beyond subsistence level existence. And um, so subsistence existence is assigned to people in a, in, in, in a society and in a system. Um, and, and when that's the case, it's very difficult to uh, organize yourself um, in a cohesive and forward moving way. Um, and the massacre was one more example of the disrupt destruction and disruption that is imposed on the African-American community at, 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 as it was striving to, re to, to move on from enslavement and incomplete reconstruction, Jim Crow and you know all the things uh, all the way up until the civil rights movement. And we're still struggling as a country. And I'm not saying this is exclusive to African-Americans. We're all still struggling for democracy and, uh, and, and civ a civic life where uh, people can have the grace to expect justice and um, um, equal opportunity and equal protection under the law. So these are still the same themes that we see over and over again. And we also see that uh, certain segments are always going to be resistant and will go so far as to resort to violence to stop other people 
um, in an intersectional way as you use it from having even the basics of life um, or of a uh, basics of a decent life, I say. So, um, you know, the struggle does continue. Um, and this is a, this is a, um, a very in your face example, I think, because it's a very short time period. It's a very discreet time period. You can describe all of these things uh, and, and their impact um, by pointing back to the things that happened uh, and led up to those two days. Thank you uh, so much for that. I wanted to, as we're about to close out here, um, I have all the questions, of course, but I'll finish out with this like one and a half one. Um, as we speak and talk and we sit now in this after and, and where your work falls and can like singing her song and giving her credit and, and um, making sure her work and, and the importance of her work um, lives on and is known, I wanted to uh, ask to you, ask you to ask you to speak more about like what your work looks like now um, in doing that, and and also like speaking to the necessity of remembering and 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 retelling these stories, keeping them alive, um, and 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 as you said before, and and so in some of your writings, the importance of us to control and preserve our own history. Absolutely, I, I do appreciate that question so much, um, Professor. Timothy Snyder at Yale talks very much about what memory laws are all about. Memory laws are what of Florida, for example, in Texas, where they are um, very much suppressing, um, the, which, as we know, it is a universal history of our country. It applies um, very much to today. Um, and it is uh, foundational to, uh, um, you know, our our first mistake, um, and and that and that really is something that is all consuming and is so important to uh, not honor necessarily, but to grapple with. And that's a very different thing. We're not asking for dispensation or some type of indulgence. This is necessary work when you're thinking about establishing the kind of decent and um, and democratic civil society that you want to live in. It's, it's, in it, it's forward, very much forward focused, not backward focused. Um, and so that's one thing I want to say about, you know, memory laws. And that that is such an important term. It, it's it, controlling the history and the memory of, of a country or a people is, is one of the things that dictators do. Um, they make it uh, illegal to talk about um, the past, a, a past that's anathema to them and their interests. So that's one thing. And, and, and I am determined to uh, continue to tell this story and, and, and in all of its um, uh, ramifications and iterations. Um, another part um, is that she continues to inspire, inspire me. I got this book in 1994. And because of my own travails, I have not had an opportunity to do as much before 2021 as I would have liked. I'm looking more deeply into my own family roots. Uh, I'm trying to find the Jones family. Um, I have no connection with them at all, except this one name that I have in this book, um, the person who basically bequeathed it to my father. Uh, I, I don't, I, I have no um, understanding of their family other than knowing that they came uh, to Oklahoma from Yazoo City, Mississippi. Um, and so I, I have some Mississippi roots, nothing I would have ever thought. I thought Oklahoma and Texas, that's it. And, and you know, my, my knowledge and information kind of stopped there. But I think um, most important for me is that this book continues to give us information that um, is uh, the value of which has not been fully realized. I gave you, I, I think I told you um, that, um, you know, uh, there is, there are efforts uh, right now with um, the DNA tracing of the uh, massacre victims, uh, perhaps in hidden graves and so forth. But I have met somebody uh, through a kind of a chance encounter uh, who is a part of that project who lives right here in Silver Spring. Um, she and I have uh, arranged to meet and I would like to talk to her about perhaps not even help, but what steps I can take 
to uh, get more um, information about my family. The other part is the book itself that has these data points about the incurred. And that is really something that um, a, a deep data dive could actually um, benefit. Um, and certainly valuations have been made about what was lost, but it's not just the monetary valuations. It's what the what does $125,000 represent in, in, in 1921? What does that represent in terms of work, effort, planning, execution, sophistication? What does that represent for a community that has been um, so marginalized um, and so under attack? Um, and, and uh, you know, so much more remains to be done. And I would like to just close by saying, um, I have a picture of myself as an infant with, um, with um, the little, at that time, Florence Mary Parrish Bruner. And I'm the infant and my brother, is there? I don't know if you can see it at all. Oh no! But, um, it's it's a we'll put it's it up a, here on the side. <laughs> it's, a, it's a picture of of the three of us. My older Florence, my granny Florence, my older brother William, and myself. Oh. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, Annalise, so much for your time today, your labor into this work, for being a part of this series, uh, and for honoring and sharing Mary with us. Um, that photo, uh, it, it means the world to me. Um, but one, I'm sneaking in one last little thing. Um, if you could say just one thing to Mary Parrish, what would you? And if you could tell people only one thing about her or her work or her story, um, what would you? I would thank her and I would um, let her know that she has not been forgotten. And if I have anything to do with it, she will not be forgotten. Um, I will continue to amplify her, her work, and um, this work in general. Um, and what I would like for people to know about her is um, her, her sense of personal um, resolution, her, her resoluteness, her, um, she was intrepid. Um, she envisioned something and she was able to carry it out that's really um, a valuable lesson for us all. Um, and also, um, you know, take advantage of your talents, um, bring them forward in, in service to the world. And that's it. Thank you so much. Again, I have all the thank, uh, thanks and gratitude for uh, this space and this time and conversation we had today. Um, thank you all out there for joining us for this conversation. Uh, definitely go to the 19thnews.org to check out more about Tulsa and our journalism um, and keep safe out there. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Annalise. Thank you, Kathleen.